snap, Chris, it's you again. What's up, man? You know, Andrew, it's really weird. Like, I feel like I see you all the time, but I don't see you all Dude, the time. I know. I know. I keep, there's, I have the little package behind me that has your Christmas gift that I still haven't given you, and it's February. I know. At this point, I just say we just keep what we got each other, even if it's like the wrong size, <laughs> because like, it's just so, no. but no, I, I actually refuse. think refuse. <laughs> we'll no, do you know, uh, what? you know what you know what i'm going to see my dad today to get a haircut so i'm going to leave it with him and when you go to get a haircut next he'll give it to you well i guess that doesn't <laughs> not work because i was going to go get a haircut from your dad as well probably next week i was going to message him i was going to do it but with all the snow we're having you know i'd rather just not drive right, uh right. in the snow you know mm -hmm. so with that being said i mean we'll figure it out i, I definitely okay. like because we gotta, it's gotta be done the right way, you know. It's an exchanging of gifts. I almost feel like That's even true. if it's August, it's meant to be done in person. That's fair. besides. That's fair. Christmas in August is my favorite Chevy Chase film. <laughs> um, I'm just getting in the '80s mindset. I don't know if that's actually a Chevy uh, Chase film or a film for that matter. Anyways, guys, what I do know is that this is yet another episode of Talking with Andrew and Chris. I am Chris, and I'm Andrew. That was a weird order. <laughs> that is true, yeah. But nonetheless, we are back yet again. This is eight for eight on the new year. We promised you 56 episodes, and we're going to do it. We are going to hit it. We have so many interviews lined up for the next couple of months. And to kick things off, I thought since a few of her artists are going to be coming on the show anyways, because this is a label that I recently found out about and recently fell in love with all at the same time. I figured, you know, let's uh, let's sort of paint the picture here, and what better way than to sort of get into the zone of speaking with so much art that she's involved with over the next few months than actually speaking with not only just the CEO of Aztec Records, but an amazing artist herself. Everyone, please welcome Lau to the show. Lau, how you doing today? Ooh. Hi, guys. How are you? Nice Hello. to see you. How's Thanks it going? You as well. <laughs> yeah, it's it's going great, you know. First of all, there is a bit of a time difference between us, so we just want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule to come and meet mm -hmm. with us. Uh, if we're getting this correct, you're coming all the way to us from Barcelona, Spain? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. I recently relocated to Spain a couple of months ago, and I'm loving it. It's much warmer. You can see I'm just wearing a t-shirt, well, a shirt, <laughs> um, short sleeves, and meanwhile, it's snowing in London and probably in New York as well, right? Yeah, uh, it, it hasn't stopped it has snowing been. in New York. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah so I can imagine. Shoveling. Wow, I can imagine. Yeah, so no, here is lovely. It's still mild. I'm playing beach tennis like three, four times a week. Um, wow. it's like, yeah, it's kind of mild, you know, it gets a little chilly at night, but it's, it's an amazing winter. It, it really doesn't feel like winter at all. So, uh, you yeah. moved to Spain and you're already playing beach tennis in two months. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like all the movies. <laughs> it is. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I so, know. It's very, very nineties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with that all, with that all being said, I, I am kind of curious because you do hear of people moving in a global pandemic, but what has that been like? I feel like it's just a. It's always weird to move, <laughs> and I would say even from country to country because that's such a big change. But to do it yeah. also during a global pandemic, what was that yeah. like? Well, it was very stressful, very, very stressful. I literally, um, I decided to move um, in October, pre-Brexit. So I only had two months before Brexit and um, I wanted to make sure I got out of the UK <laughs> before Brexit and, and also sort of escape, escaping many things. But the winter is one of those things where I've spent 21 years in London and I love the UK and it's, it's been my home, you know, for most of my adult life. Um, but I felt like I wanted a warmer climate and uh, I just needed a change, you know, a new place, new people. Um, I just wanted to be inspired again. And um, it was uh, it was stressful. I'm not going to lie. Um, we we basically drove 19 hours uh, with my friend John um, and my two cats. We drove from London to Barcelona, 19 hours nonstop. Um, and the day after, they closed the borders, pretty much. So this was 29th of October. So end of October, we arrived here. Um, and then he drove back. He took my car back to London. <laughs> so it wow. was crazy. It was crazy. But um, I'm glad 
I'm really glad I did it. I, I, I just felt it really strongly in my heart that it was time to, it was time for an adventure and for a big change. And this was exactly what I needed. You know, I'm, I'm absolutely loving it here. Um, so yeah, I'm happy I, I sort of, I, I took the leap, you know? Wow. Was there any reason you picked Barcelona? Yes, there's many reasons. So, I mean, I got a few friends here. That's one thing. Um, and also I'm originally from Argentina, so I speak Spanish. And I felt, you know, culturally I could, you know, sort of uh, uh, just just blend in really easily. Um, and, um, and also I always knew I was going to live somewhere with palm trees. I just wasn't sure where. Um, a few years ago, I was obsessed with moving to LA and I was nearly going to move to LA and I looked at all the sort of visas and everything. And, um, um, and then I also thought about Sydney. I, I was just thinking about different places. Um, but then Barcelona is not far from London. It's only an hour and a half um, on, on a flight. And I've got my business in the UK. I've got property there. I've got tons of things that still link me there. I've got family there as well. So, um, so yeah, I didn't want to leave Europe. That was my, my decision was, let's stay here. Um, but let's be part of Europe. You know, I didn't want to leave Europe with Brexit either. So um, I'm strongly against that. But, um, you know, it happened. So here we are. <laughs> Yeah, nice. all you can do is adjust, and it seems like you made the best of it. So that's awesome. Congrats on the move. I'm glad it's uh, it's going well. So since we're kind of speaking about you and your history, you know, you told us you were originally from Argentina, 21 years there, 21 years in the UK. Why don't you just take us back to sort of let's get your origin story here? You know, we know that you're not only an artist yourself, uh, synth pop retro wave artist. You're also the CEO of a record label. Take us back to like your first taste of art and what got you interested in it and kind of bring us up to the present day and do not feel like you're rambling at all. Everyone seems to be shy and bashful lately. We want to know everything. So okay. talk as much okay, as you feel you need. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you about my, my start, my, my starting point as a musician, first, and then I'll talk to you about the label, setting up the label with my business partner. But um, Perfect. I kind of, I first thing I did was uh, with friends from high school, did an all-girl band. We set up an all-girl band, and I was fascinated by the drums. I would always stare at the drummer. So I thought, okay, I'll take the drums. Um, I like, we played a couple of years. Um, eventually, when I turned 21, I moved to the UK, and I thought, I'm going to make that hobby a career. I'm going to actually take music really seriously. I'm going to go to university. I'm going to go to music college. You know, I did everything I had to do in the UK. I studied for five years, got a music degree. And then when I became a sort of a session drummer, so that's what I did for, for a long time. Um, and at that time, this was like nearly 20 years ago, but at that time there weren't a lot of girl drummers out there. So now of course it's perfectly normal and it should be, you know, it really should be. But back then it was like, people would look twice when you saw a girl playing drums or bass, you know, so it was kind of special. And in a way it helped me, it opened doors because I ended up playing some big sessions for like pop parties like Ricky Martin, Sam Sparrow, Tayo Cruz, uh, Clean Bandit, Big Black Delta. So some really big artists. Went around the world touring with them as a drummer. Eventually I became a producer and DJ as well. Um, I'm sort of in the back of my head, I was always a songwriter. I just never, I never voiced it. So I would write songs for other people, but I was always in the background. Um, and eventually, um, one day I met my business partner, his name is Ariel. We met in London. He's also from Argentina, but it was just coincidental that we were both living in London at the time and he had a band. So I was drumming for him for a little bit. And then he said, oh, I'm going to set up a label just to release my own songs. So he was just going to release his own band. That's, that's the, that's the only reason why he started or he registered Aztec Records. And I said to him, yeah, but I know, like I'm surrounded by musicians and amazing artists. I was like, we can release music all the time. Like I can bring loads of amazing music, you know? And he was like, okay, cool, let's do it. And we, we literally joined forces there and then. And it was kind of, it was kind of like a hobby at first. So the first few years we were kind of dormant in a way. We were just releasing very eclectic and very, very rare, you know, bits and pieces, not very active at all. <clears throat> Eventually we met and, well, we discovered Nina in, I think it was 2010, 2011. And we developed her and found her sound and wrote songs for her and, 
did a whole, you know, a, a lot of work to get to where she is now. Uh, she's one of the sort of biggest names in synthwave right now. One of the few female synthwave vocalists, really. Um, and at that time, the synthwave genre was just starting. So the Drive movie just came out. It was it was this cult movement underground. Um, and this whole retro wave thing, going back to the 80s and having all these pulsating themes, you know. Um, so it was all fairly new. And we kind of were there at the beginning of that journey. And we connected with a lot of these underground producers on SoundCloud. Um, uh, I co-wrote uh, well, three of the Nina albums pretty much with her and, and producers. And as that started to grow and synthwave started to grow, we found more and more synthwave artists were appearing everywhere and sending us music. So it became this thing, you know, so it started to become a business. So from, you know, we, I can honestly say we, we lost money for many, many, many years. It, it took, it took a long time when it's a hobby, you just throw money at it, you know, and not a lot comes, comes back, but it took years and it took trial and error to learn how to invest, what to do, where to take an artist, you know, what to do and what not to do and how to guide them, how to nurture them, etc. Um, and finally, we can say it worked, you know, now it works as a business. So now it's a team of 13 people uh, covering different aspects. Some are full time, some are part time, but Synthwave is thriving. I mean, I mean you probably saw the Super Bowl <laughs> with uh, the weekend the other day, but Synthwave is gone mainstream. So it kind of helped us, even though we're still on a independent level, but it put us on the map. And um, and I think it's opening doors to a wider audience, whereas before it was just our little community. Um, and basically that's that was that's the story. It's just we, we're releasing music that we really love, that we're passionate about. And um, and I think we have really high standards of the music we release as well. We make sure they are really good songs. Um, it's not just the visual aspect um, or just the instrumentals. For us, it needs to be really strong lyrics and vocals as well. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting to hear because what I know Aztec Records to be um, is, and I stumbled upon you guys through a sunglasses kid. Uh, when me and Andrew yeah. found him, me and Andrew actually found him together um, in the parking right lot. Of my a, house. Right outside my house. Yeah, right outside of <laughs> Andrew's house. I was just house. talking to Ed. I was just oh yeah, he's um he'll he's actually awesome. be on the show in a few weeks as well. Um he's uh, seems to be really good about answering his Instagram DMs and stuff, so we're looking forward to chatting with him. But he's uh great. I don't know, Andrew, I, I cuz I thought it was an accident. We I think we typed something else in on Spotify or I told Andrew to play something else and then he came up. No, but no I think <laughs> how you, that happened? you played something and it had the you have the like the gaplet or endless music on on your Spotify so when that oh, song ended, right. sunglasses kid just started playing. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Okay, so it started playing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, and then Andrew's like, I mean, do you, and I was like, yeah, leave this on though. It's kind of tight. And I remember us both like kind of vibing to it. It was Night Swim. Yeah. And we, we, and, yeah, we definitely uh, also got a kick out of the name Sunglasses Kid. Yeah, yeah, we're like, oh, that's interesting. It's not like '84 something. You know what I mean? It yeah. was like pretty yeah, yeah, uh, refreshing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and his artwork too wasn't like super like. Yeah pink and cool. um you know blue like he had like something pretty unique in the sense and we're like then i started listening to more of your artists and they all are you know in the retro wave genre and scene but they all kind of seem to have carved out their own unique t uh touch or yeah. sort of approach to it so it's kind of interesting to hear that your your label didn't start out as a synthwave label kind of found itself in the synthwave genre because that's kind of what I get from a lot of your artists, you know, they kind of seem to be the yeah. outsiders of the synthwave scene. And I was wondering if maybe you could speak a little more to that, if I'm correct or if I'm wrong, you know? Yeah, well, I wouldn't say outsiders. There's a lot of synthwave in there. It's just not the, that pure instrumental synthwave, which is what me and Nina changed. So we, when we started, it was only instrumental synthwave. It was only guys making beats in their bedrooms. And we were like, let's put some vocals to this. Let's make it into a song. Let's have structure, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, middle, late, ad libs at the end, intro, outro. Let's arrange these songs and turn them into proper songs, not just background music, because there is tons and tons of that. And although there's some incredible producers out there, and, and it's fantastic for film and TV, I totally agree with that. 
but it all starts to sound a little bit the same after a while if you only have instrumentals. Um, and then you'll see that the biggest bands in Pink Wave, they have vocals, you know, the Midnight, the FM84, you know, etc. cetera. Um, Nina, you know, so that, that's what we found ourselves at. We, but we also love synth pop. So we come from a pop background, you know, I always loved pop. Um, and it's a very, it's a very close sort of link, I think. It all merges into this retro sound and it's a bit more poppy, a bit more, you know, a bit more um, retro. There's, there's different elements in there. Um, but you're going to hear that even Sunglasses Kid and a lot of our artists, it's, you're going to hear some Madonna influences in there. You're going to hear, um, um, I don't know, um, the Pesh Mode, of course, and, and Duran Duran, and all these influences are there somewhere. And that's what I love. You know, that's what I, I love. I love melody. I love lyrics. I love songs that are well-rounded, that sound good, no matter how you produce them. As a publisher, that's what we look for, you know. Um, so, so, yeah, we didn't, I think Synthwave was just starting at that point, but it was a big inspiration for us. And, and you know, we tried the pop sound and the dance, Euro dance thing at the beginning in 2010, 2012, and it didn't quite work. And then when we discovered Synthwave, we went, yeah, that suits her vocal really well. Let's go with that. And, and then it just started to grow and grow and grow. And we realized she was the only, she was at the time, pretty much she was the only female synthwave artist. So she was crowned the queen of synthwave at the time, you know? Now, of course, there's tons and there's, there's hundreds more artists and, and the whole genre just blew up, which is fantastic, you know? Um, but yeah, we, we are, I think we have a, a very particular aesthetic and sound we go for. And when I describe the label, I would say synth wave, synth pop, retro wave. That includes the three genres we do. Even though we've done a couple of comp uh, compilations of dark synth, you know, um, or dark wave um, and Latin synth, and we, we just launched the Latin branch. So we, we release electronic music in Spanish. Um, that's something we just launched this year. So, well, last year, 2020. So. But yeah, we focus mainly on those three genres, and um, and that that encapsulates a lot of a lot of music, you know, a lot of music. So so yeah, I don't think we're synthwave outsiders. We're just not purely synthwave because then that would be just instrumentals, just samey samey, not a lot of vocals, and and that's not really what we do. Yeah. No, very cool. Very interesting. Um, so kind of the last thing I wanted to ask you on more of the label side before we talk about you as an artist yourself, and this kind of is a nice segue to that. What do you try to do as an independent label who is, you know, you're the founder, one of the two founders, and you're an artist yourself? Um, what do you try and offer that perhaps maybe like a major label can't or knowing that you don't have the same resources as a major label, what do you feel that you bring to the table as an entrepreneur, an artist, and an independent label to the artist you work with? So, well, there's a few things, but the first thing is that both me and Ariel, my business partner, we're both musicians. So um, on top of that, Ariel is an amazing sound engineer, and he was a soundman for Phantom of the Opera in the West End for like nearly 15 years. Um, I'm a musician, drummer, producer, DJ. I've done tons of things. So the main thing is we both we we both been and are artists. That's one thing, and so we understand both sides. That's one thing, first of all, because um, I just I hate it when I don't know label executives. They sometimes they don't they're not musicians, so there's a lot of things they don't quite understand or they can't guide you in a in an artistic kind of way. So we are we've got knowledge about that that's one thing we can relate to the artists we can relate to both sides but we also know the business side so we got both um the other thing you were talking about resources is we are very resourceful so everything we do we're very careful where we invest and how we do things um because at the end of the day of course the artist needs to recoup that money so of course you can spend millions on something and the poor artist is never going to recoup that money and it doesn't serve them, you know. It depends. Each artist is different. Um, what they bring 
to the table and what, at what level they're at, what fan base they're bringing in, you know, etc. But um, we are resourceful. We will sort of identify what each artist needs. Um, some bands are ready to go. They've got everything sorted. They already have their videos and their photos and their social media is amazing. Some bands are sorted pretty much and we just help with PR, with physicals, vinyl, cassettes, CDs, promotion, radio, whatever needs to be do done. Other bands, other artists are just starting. So we need to help them develop. We help them find maybe an image, a logo, their sound. We pair them up with producers. We get them remixes. We pair them up with, uh, with vocalists. We do feature, you know, there's so many things that can be done. Um, and of course there's the press up aspect, the vinyl aspect, the, 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 the cassettes, the, all the physicals that cost thousands of, of dollars or pounds, you know? So we can help in any area that needs helping. And both myself and I are, uh, my, both myself and Ariel are on WhatsApp all the time. So we'll be chatting to the artist, like, you know, kind of directly. Um, we reply very quickly. You know, I've dealt with labels where like three weeks or a month goes by and they don't reply to one email. And you're like, ah, you know, just answer to an email, you know, to, to license a track or whatever it is. So we are small, but we're not that small. So we will delegate to the team to everyone, you know, we've got someone in charge of YouTube, someone in charge of social media, someone in charge of physical distribution worldwide, uh, John in charge of press and PR, you know, we've got tons of people, designers and video makers. So we will delegate, but you will deal with me and Ariel directly um, most of the time. So we will kind of, it's kind of like project managing in a way, you know. Um, and being an artist is a project. It's a project and you should project manage. You should know what are you trying to do? Where are you going? Who are you going to delegate all these tasks to get it done, you know, and have a schedule, etc. So that's that's what we do. And we're happy to do it. Yeah, no, totally. Um, Andrew and I are um, no strangers to sort of being on uh, independent labels as well uh, in our old bands. And it's it's frustrating sometimes, you know, um, just mm -hmm. the the chain of command. Uh, sometimes it's like, yeah. well, this is a smaller outfit. Why aren't you answering me? And I think mm -hmm. that that comes from only ever being an artist, not considering a lot of right. what you just said in regards to how you have to manage so many. It's not just your. It's it's not just about you. I think artists forget that, right. but it seems like you guys do a good job of yeah, sort of still, balancing that still, out. Um, I still don't think a label should leave you waiting three weeks to answer an email, and 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 I've seen that happen a lot. Right. With, with some of the guys, you know, um, even if it's some just, of the uh, with hey, I'm with... still working on it, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, nothing. It's like, yep, yeah, sorry, it was like nothing. You get an automatic reply and then a month goes by or whatever, you know, that I think that never happened to us. <laughs> like, it's impossible. Like, if I'm an ape, if I'm away, I'll tell everyone I'm away and he can take charge and, you know, but we don't just don't answer we'll be like oh sorry i'm away i'll you know i'll answer properly as soon as i get back or whatever but i think it's important and um and if we keep growing and we reach a point where we can't answer millions of emails well then i'll employ more people but i think it's um you need to you need to grow as your business grows otherwise people are not going to be happy you know and that goes for everything we're, we're now growing in 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 the, in the sense of um physical distribution, we're selling more vinyl and cassettes than ever. You know, it's it's all going back. People really want to own the, the the physicals and and we had to we have to expand and we, we have to we we looking at ways of expanding and finding you know bigger storage and, and, and a bigger worldwide distributor that you know if we're getting demand from Australia, Japan and America, we wanna have those records there ready for people to buy them. So you need to expand as your business grows. Otherwise, it's it becomes a bit frustrating for everyone, you know? Totally. No, that's uh, that's really, you know, that's, as someone who one day yeah. hopes to own a podcasting network, that's, uh, I think a lot of people can take yeah. a lot away from that. So. And I think anyone on your label listening to this uh, just felt a sigh of relief, just being like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much yeah, exactly what I mean, you want to hear. <laughs> 
they know us, but that's the thing. I mean, I and I've, I've dealt with major labels. So I was playing for a lot of major label artists, and 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 I went through that myself. I went through that where you got to talk to this one and this one and this one and this one. So they can approve that tiny budget to go and do that tiny thing. And it's like, you know what? Don't worry about it. I'll pay for it myself. I'm not going to wait wait three weeks for you to to let me do that. You know, or there's things that just is such bureaucracy at that level. Um, and also major labels have one or two huge artists that bring in all the money and then everyone else is just, I don't think they're just floating around. They're not getting a lot of attention. You know, that's unfortunately that's how that's how the business model works. Yeah, Chris unfortunately um, knows what that's like. <laughs> Fortunately, and you know what I will say, especially well, with this day and age. Uh, back in the day, yeah, I was in a hardcore band back in the day. We were also too young, granted, to be signed. Like the oldest member was twenty, and probably turned twenty, like you know, halfway through our experience with them. So we were very young, but. The one thing I will say is, uh, on top of all that, um, because that was sort of pre this day and age of when that happened to us, you need to be consistently putting out music. You really don't want to stay stagnant, especially now. Yeah. Uh, I'm not too in touch with how it's going on in Europe, but America shows are not happening. Uh, people are booking tours for 2022. Obviously, Same. the pandemic is the reason behind that. So before that you wanted to put out smaller EPs and if you put out an album have an EP ready to go three months afterwards or a few a few singles afterwards and if you have to wait for the project manager to speak to the executive to speak to the director yeah five months goes by that single you put out that just made a splash has now been forgotten because of how quickly Spotify moves and so I think independent labels like yourself kind of have an advantage in regards to all that but before we jump off the label side of things actually to be curious as someone who's the CEO of a, of a record label that's been around for over 10 years now and, and sort of independently as well, what has been your guys' approach to not only the way the music industry has changed in regards to we're kind of back to like the 1950s now where it's all single-based, but yeah. with the with <laughs> there not being shows, how have you guys been working with your artists to keep their revenue up and keep them paying their bills? Well, I mean, it's artists is different. Uh, I don't think any of our artists... Um, were depending on their live income, okay? So, um, even though we've done lots of touring with Nina, and she, and she was the biggest sort of touring one in our roster at the time, um, and I toured with her, I was I was half of the band for, for nine years. Um, we didn't rely on that income for to live on, uh, you know, Spotify, YouTube, and physical sales brought in most of the money, not not the live shows. The live shows, actually, we were probably breaking even or sometimes even losing, the, you know, losing money. So it it depends. It depends on each artist. I think every case is different. Um, now, the rock scene, maybe, were, and the hardcore scene uh, that, that you come from, I think this, you know, rock gigs, I think it's more about playing and playing and playing and playing gigs. Um, seems like sure. there's not that many. So we were lucky to play every little synthwave event that showed up, every synthwave festival, you know, Helsinki and, and, and Stockholm. And, and we played in Barcelona. Our last show was here a year ago in, in January, actually. Um, so, and those were great, but they're kind of niche and they were very kind of not small, but just niche, you know, and, and the promoters are like gambling. They're like, look, this is new. This is like the first ever synthwave event in Barcelona or, or in Helsinki for that matter, you know? So, and I know that, and I recognize all these pockets of synthwave coming up, you know, we played in Buenos Aires and, you know, and like all around the world. And I can see people are trying, are trying really hard. And these are fans getting together, um, like in Mexico and Brazil and, doing their own synthway parties and starting and trying to save up so they can bring a big artist to perform, you know? So it's a different world. We never, unless that you were the Midnight or FM84, um, well, not even, but unless that you were the Midnight, um, you weren't relying on that live income, if you know what I mean. Totally. Most of these uh, producers right. and most of our artists they're not they weren't really touring that much and if they were it was for fun rather than for you know to pay their mortgage so the the main focus like you said is to stay active you were asking me about all these changes and you know the music industry 
is unlike any other industry in the world. Like I always tell people, if I had been selling potatoes for 10 years, I would probably be rich by now. But trying to sell music, it's constantly changing, constantly. So one day you think you build something and then a new platform comes up and you got to start all over again. And it's not easy. Um, you got to be constantly on top of technology, constantly on top of what's the newest trend, what's the newest, you know, how do we do this? How do we do that? You know, so um, it's, it's exhausting, but it's also exciting and rewarding. So you got to stay, stay on top of it. You got to constantly produce content, as you know, Spotify algorithms and all that, which we're all trying to crack, you know, no one knows how it works. They're all making it up. <laughs> it's the million dollar question right there. <laughs> no one knows. Yeah, you read one article, they say this, you know, yeah, yeah, editorial. Yeah, they're going to listen to it. No one, I don't know. I don't, right. And then there's don't four know. YouTube videos all saying Honestly, different things about how to get right. playlisted. It's... I've Keeps read a fun. million articles about it. It's like, yeah, yeah, I'll go, just throw the world, the world algorithm in there. Right. Some of them um, are like, throw money at Spotify, and some of them are like, Spotify doesn't want your money. It's just like, I can't yeah, keep up. Yeah. Well, we we we're gonna try Spotify ads, and we're gonna try all that. Like, it's fine. You, you again, it's trial and error. Trial and error. You try and exactly. see what did that convert to sales? Did that bring more fans to the artist? Uh, or, or did I gain more fans by spending the same money on Instagram and doing an amazing ad on Instagram? Or did I get a better return by doing the proper PR and, and appearing on a local newspaper or, or on a big blog or, or whatever? So there's so many ways to do it. And, and I think um, I've been in the music industry for so many years and the artists that you see succeeding are usually the most original ones. So they are really original at the way they, they approach PR and how are they going to sell this record? Why are they so different? Why should people listen to them and not the other million synthwave artists out there? You know, so it's it's about it's a lot to do with the artist. So there's there's a lot of money you can throw at something, but a lot a lot of it has to do with you being original, writing good songs, and having a good predisposition to you know to talk to your fans, to be proactive, to listen to what people tell you take that on board if they like something give them more of that if they didn't like something they're telling you you should maybe listen to that you know it's a uh, it's give and take and and i feel it with my music as well i hear what people like and you can look at your stats you can see what you posted did it work did it not work there's a lot of work you can do yourself you know um, and as a label with it just to help you and to enhance that of course and to maybe maybe we'll We'll show you things that maybe you didn't know, or will you know, will will help. But um, but a lot of it is to do with the artists and and their proactivity and their creativity as well. How they market themselves is really important. Yeah. No. Well. Well said. Um, before we jump into the second half of this conversation, where I want to speak about you and everything you do with Lau and your new record, is there anything in the Aztec side of things that we may have missed out, or that you want to let us know? No, I mean, if you, uh, anyone listening uh, or watching, you can go to aztecrecords.com. That's going to take you to our Bandcamp page with over 30 artists. Um, and and like, like we were saying at the beginning, there's different sounds within synthwave and retrowave and synthpop in there, but it's all in the same bag. So most probably you will like most of our artists, even though they're very different. So go check them out and check out the merch store. There's tons of amazing vinyl cassettes posters all sorts of things cool yeah definitely and we'll throw the link to all that good stuff in the description of this video and in the show notes now let's talk about i mean more so what i guess is because we were talking about you and your label side let's talk about you and your artist side um i was gonna say let's talk about you but we were already doing that that would have been silly but <laughs> <laughs> so anyway what do you want to talk about <laughs> uh so you just dropped an album called believer and we watched your new Tomorrow. video, which came, well, yeah, but I guess the illusion is <laughs> that this is going out on Monday, but you're right. It comes yeah, out yeah. February 12th. If you're listening to this, couple um, of hours. yeah, just a couple hours for you. So I'm sure you're excited. We got to watch the music video for True. I thought it was really awesome for a lot of reasons. But before I tell you what those are, why don't you tell us about your new record, the video, and anything you really want us to know about yourself as Lau? Okay. Well, um... 
my basically it's my debut album so it took uh, it took nine months in the making um i got inspired by basically after a painful breakup like all my breakups are painful of course but i got inspired and i just had to get all these emotions out and 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 i wrote lots of songs uh with different producers and i think the album portrays every emotion i went through so from obviously the sadness the you know feeling down, you know, the heartbreak, all that. But then starting to feel a bit more hopeful, wanting to fall in love again, you know, um, starting a new life in a new city. Um, and then understanding that I am where I should be. So understanding that after all that pain and all that year of pain and loss and whatever, um, you finally will sort of see the light and find yourself in a better place and heal time will heal everything so my album is all those emotions and i know it sounds really depressing but it isn't like the, all the music is really upbeat um it's kind of you know synth pop retro wave um i you know the sort of madonna tears for fears influences roxette uh, queen um, you know all the bands that i love you know heim uh, robin Christina and the Queens, all these artists, past and present, that I really admire, and lots of harmonies, uh, which I really love. Um, and that's it, really. I, I, I wrote songs for, for Nina for nearly a decade, and, and now I feel like it was my, I think I feel like now I believe in myself to launch myself as a solo artist. It took a long time to come to this point and go, this is who I am, this is how I sing, and this is the way I look. Some people will like it, some people won't, I don't know, but this is it, you know, and that takes a lot of guts. Um, so I think I've basically I've, I've reached this point where I'm comfortable with it and I'm happy with my music. Yeah, totally. Um, I think that the video was, uh, I mean, not that I, I knew you at the time of watching it, but it felt very genuine. I, there was a positivity to it. You, you say all these negative yeah. things that the album's rooted off of, but it just seems yeah, I, like was, I was surprised to hear that because the video was so like fun and upbeat. <laughs> I know, I know. The, the different songs and different lyrics. If, when you listen to the whole album properly, um, the some of the, you know, there's a couple of sort of power ballads in there about you know I can't believe you did this to me kind of thing. But um, but yeah, it's all it's all you know. It's, it's a very honest album, that's for sure. And I've, you know. It's honest. It is honest. And I've, I've um, I really poured my heart out into this one. And the video was, was so much fun to make. Um, we filmed it here in Barcelona, of course, there's palm trees and the beach and um, it was winter, so it was cold. And you, you see the palm trees like kind of flying around. But, um, but it was, it was great. It was, it was lots of fun. It was directed by Luis Miras, who is an amazing DOP. Um, He'd done a lot of movies here in, in Spain and he, he just really helped me out with this video. Um, and I always, you know, I, I always sort of clone myself in, in my own acoustic videos. I don't know if you've seen them on, on my YouTube channel, but because I write songs where I answer myself and I harmonize with myself, it's like question and answer. So I tend to clone myself when I'm doing acoustic videos. You two or three of me singing to myself you know so i thought i want to do the same thing on on this video for true and um i think it worked out quite well there's a bit of a storyline there and you know a bit of humor which is what i always put in my videos as well so yeah i'm quite pleased with it yeah i thought it was really cool and the one thing that i thought was really interesting was you know a lot of the synthwave artists will just take like clips of like total recall or um top or just, gun or just I like know, people I walking know. at night in new york city and and so you actually so kind of like had more of like um a, a, a mainstream approach to the music video which i don't see a lot of synthwave artists really do in fact i don't really see a lot of music videos that are actually featuring them in it unless it's like some of the bigger names like the midnight they'll do like those tour sort of montage videos so what was like the, yeah. the thought process behind that because it is a little different it's a little outside the typical mold of uh, the synthwave synth pop genre i mean i think it's very synth pop um not very synthwave but very synth pop 
to to do a video like that. Um, like I said, like my, my current influences are, you know, Hein, Christine and the Queens, Robin, where, you know, it's this kind of crying at the dance floor kind of feeling. So the lyrics are sad, but the music is so uplifting and you just wanna you just wanna move, you know? And I and I feel that with my album. I wanna dance when I listen to it. There's only two power ballads, but the rest is quite upbeat. Um, I think I always approached music, you'll see it throughout Nina's career, all her videos, she appears on them and, and I, I produced them and I was there. Um, you know, I, I thought of all her videos with, with Osilian or whoever was filming her videos. Um, I always had this kind of mainstream approach. You know, I, I want people to connect with the artist and, and that's why so many people fell in love with Nina because she, she's singing to them, you know, it's not just a, a mask or, or an avatar or, or someone, you know, a faceless person, you actually, people get to know her and fans really feel like they know her and they, you know, they send her these amazing messages and, and, and stuff. So I think for me, it's, it's hard to pretend to be something I'm not. I'm, I'm this, you know, and a lot of people know me right now. I've been around for a long time, just not in this role of singing, you know, and at the front, I was always in the background. So. Um, I would find it weird to suddenly become something else that I'm not. This is who I am. I've always been, you know, I've always, I've always been around. Um, but this is my, I always call it my, my latest sort of reincarnation in music. It's now I'm a solo artist and I'm a singer, whereas before I was more of a producer, composer, drummer, you know. Um, but yeah, I think it's, uh, it takes a lot of guts to do that, to go, this is me. You know, um, so what Nina's done, what Olive Wright does, what Mike Lockley, you know, this is me, this is my voice, this is my face, this is me. You know, some people will like it and some people won't. And, and you need to accept that. We're also scared that people won't like us and that you're gonna have maybe one nasty comment, but you're gonna have hundreds of good ones, you know? So it's fear, it's fear-based. So we're all like, I'm not gonna show my face, I'm not gonna, I'm just going to put a mask on and it works for some artists. If you're a Daft Punk, of course, you know, um, True. that's absolutely fine. But that's a conscious choice they made, you know, but um, for some artists, I think in our scene where everyone knows me, I, I just found it would have been silly to, to keep hiding. That's exactly the opposite mm -hmm. I want to do. Uh, I don't want to be in the shadows anymore. I want to come out of the shadows. And phonies get found out. It, yeah. Yeah. But, or you feel it, or you feel it when someone sings something and they didn't really write it. And then in an interview, they ask them, what's that song about? And they're like, eh, I don't know. Well, oh, I was sad. you feel it, you know, you, you know that maybe they didn't write that song. Maybe they don't have a clue what they're singing about. So, but I, I have nothing against people writing for other people. I did it for years. I'm just saying people, you know, the, the audience can feel that. I think, um, yeah, the audience can feel it. So the more honest your art is, I think the more you're gonna touch people and the more you're gonna connect. That's what no, I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, no, <Badly>. totally. Yeah. <laughs> no, we get it. Yeah, I think I wish more people would sort of approach their art um, because, you, you know, I was gonna say, I wish more people would approach their art less as a commodity and more from that perspective. But I think there is a way which you clearly show that you need to have a business mind and a business side, but there is a way to do it that allows for, you know, uh, pure um, expression to also not get stepped on. So what's that kind of been like for you as both the CEO of an artist who has to, I mean, the CEO of a record label who has to be business minded or else, well, let's be honest, your income and, and everyone that you support and everyone you try and promote your artists, your, your staff, they rely on you, but you also don't want to, produce something that comes across as synthetic or as like uh, more of a product you want to produce art. Is there a tough line to walk? Not really, not really. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm very, very demanding with what we sign and who we can work with and what we release, you know, I, um, their music needs to touch me. So I think, myself and Ariel have a talent for spotting talent. I think that's our talent is we can spot the raw diamond, if you like. And um, 
we can tell what needs to be done to fix it, if the production or the mixing is improving or mastering is not great, or the artwork is not great, but you know, you, so you, you can peel off and go, what needs to be fixed? A lot of things can be fixed, um, but the main thing is the artist needs to have a good work ethic. Um, of course, the songs need to be good. Um, and that's pretty much it. As long as you got those really basic ingredients, everything else you can build around and you can fix, you know. Um, so for me as an artist and a label, yes, I've had a lot of situations where there's conflict of interest uh, because there's this good, good cop, bad cop situation where, you know, it, it's, it's complicated, but, but I've become friends with a lot of my artists and, and it's complicated that, to start talking to and, and you know, it's like sometimes it can be a little awkward. And when you reach that point, you have to employ someone else to do it. So just you know, you gotta remove yourself from that situation and, and let someone else deal with that. Um, otherwise, relationships can suffer. You know, um, so I think it's um, yeah, you gotta you gotta be wise how you deal with people and how you you know taking care of your reputation, I think it's really important. Um, but, but yeah, yeah, it's a, I'm not gonna say it's, it's really easy because it isn't. I've got two, two brains, one is the creative and one is the business one. And a lot of artists do, um, but it's, it's not easy. Sometimes uh, there is conflict of interest, but, you know. I love both. I love the label and the community we've created and the releases we put out every week. I absolutely love them. I'm, I'm honestly a fan of our music and of all these artists. And I also love to create and tour and, and perform and do what I do as well, you know? So I've got, this is me, I'm half and half. I, I can't help it. Yeah, I think it's also really cool to hear that you have the foresight to uh, understand that you do need the relationship with your artists, but sometimes having a team and sort of putting the uh, difficult conversation Maybe on someone, someone else. else. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it seems valuable, I would say. Yeah, uh, I think delegating, can... delegating is one of the most important things that a CEO has to do, and it's just a good one Absolutely. does it well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And we, I mean, it took us years to learn that and to start delegating, and, and that's when we started to grow. It's mm -hmm. when we went, okay, we need a team for this, a team for that, a team for mm -hmm. that, you know. Um, right. But but we did it, we kind of did it slowly as well. We took our time, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get up to a point where, like, all right, I can't, I can't deal with this anymore. Let's just put someone in charge of that and someone in charge of that. And, and you start, it, it becomes obvious when you reach that point. Cause, cause you, right, when you be... start spinning too many plates, yeah. they're all bound to fall. Exactly. You're going to feel so frustrated. You're like, ah, oh, I can't do this like i can't do my job properly because i'm looking after that that someone could do that easily you know so so yeah it's uh it, it's kind of obvious but you gotta listen to well, listen to your heart and to yourself as well because you can't be angry and frustrated and, and, and arguing with people you know you want to make sure you're you're keeping your cool you're doing your job really well you're being creative you're being productive I think that's important, you know, it's important for me, for Ariel, super important. And we want to make sure everyone on the team feels the same way. If they feel that they are doing too much of it or they're stretching, then we'll, we'll bring in someone to help them and, you know, keep growing. Why not? As long as we can do it, we'll keep doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Just like Nancy Wilson said, listen to your heart. That's uh, <laughs> solid <laughs> advice. Um, so lastly, lastly, before we sort of get out of here, we don't want to eat up too much more of your time. Um, what okay. is the future for Lao and Aztec? What can we expect? And, and you know, we, we know you just put the record out, but uh, I'm sure someone like you already has plans far into the future. So is there anything <laughs> you could share with us? I've done a couple of really cool collaborations. I'm waiting for them to come out. And, and my song's being used on 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 an advert somewhere and any i can't i can't say much but there's a few really cool things happening my plan is to now start focusing on the on the live show which i i haven't really prepared my live show because there hasn't been a need for it but i but i've had a couple of offers to do streaming shows and that kind of stuff so i'm i'm looking at doing my live show somehow cloning myself i'll see what i can do um and uh, and I've already started 
thinking about the second album. I know it sounds crazy because my first album is coming in a couple of hours, but um, I have about 17 songs that didn't make it into this album that I'm looking at, you know, reworking for the second one. And then for Aztec Records, it's uh, we just we keep signing amazing talent, and and the more we grow, the more the caliber of the artists grow. That's that's the fantastic thing. We keep getting sent better and better demos, and 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 I love that. I love that. So I would encourage people to keep sending in your demos if you're synth pop, synth wave, or retro wave. Um, it's submissions at gmail.com. So you're gonna find that on our Bandcamp page and everywhere. We don't hide that email from anyone. Please send in your music. If you think you like our artists and you're going to fit our roster, um, have a listen and see. And, you know, send us quality music. We, we love it. Um, we'll, I think we'll keep growing. We just launched the Latin American branch in Spanish as well. So the idea is just to carry on doing what we're doing, you know, and keep learning and, and keep creating beautiful music. Truly awesome. This was awesome. a really great, yeah, great conversation. I, I appreciate you being so forthcoming with a bunch of like mm -hmm. the business side of things and just kind of letting us in the mind of, of how you operate. I think that a lot of people are going to really enjoy this one. So thank you again so much for all that you shared with us to tonight. This was a great conversation. No worries. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. And before we let you go, we do have a set question that we like to ask every guest. And, and Andrew usually does the honors of delivering that. So one final question for you, if that's okay. Okay. If you had to describe yourself as an artist, creative, creator, whatever you want to call it, if you had to describe yourself with one word, what would that one word be? And then you can elaborate on why you picked that word. Like one word. 80s. Yeah. Okay. That's the first yeah. time we've gotten a number. Yeah, True. because it it just means a lot to me. I mean, I was born in seventy eight, but eighty the eighties is when I was I was a child in the eighties, and um, you know, my first cassette was Tina Turner. What love got to do with it? You know, and I That's just pretty cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, and then I had another cassette which was Milli Vanilli, but we won't go there. Um, oh yeah, Ooh, we don't want to talk about them. Go too soon. Going back too to soon. the uh, you know too transparency soon. and art being a parent, the they're a perfect example. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The music was great. Whoever sang it, I know it wasn't them, but yeah, oh, well, <laughs> so good. I danced a lot. And 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 well, if we move to early nineties, I uh, I grew up listening to Erasure, you know, and um, and I ended up opening for them on tour with Nina, and that was like a dream come true. I was like, oh my god, I grew up listening to these guys. Um, so anyway, just the eighties, the, the sound, the aesthetic. Everything about the sort of late eighties, early nineties, it, it really influences my music and, and it's just something that I love. I get that nostalgic feeling. I think a lot of listeners of Retrowave and Synth Wave and Synth Pop, they feel the same way. We we just love it. I think that's always gonna be there in my music or or on, on in fact the music we release on the label is it, it's got that continuity that links all the artists together, you know. Wow. Very cool. And and last quick question: How are the cats like in Barcelona? The cats. <laughs> yeah, yeah I've been wondering the whole yeah. time. How are they enjoying yeah, the how move? Have, how have they adjusted? It's big for them. <laughs> I'll show you. Hey, Smokey, how are you liking Barcelona? Hey, hey, hey! Oh, oh kissies! He's, he's giving me good wow. wow, what a what a that's such a whole. This is the most wholesome way we've ever ended an episode. <laughs> I have to say. Yeah. Oh, it's quite wow. a rock song. That all cat right, loves right, you. All right, Smokey. That's I awesome. All right, baby. Wow. They'll follow anyway, you in any he's, country, I guess. He's loving it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. That's great. Well, good to hear. Good to hear. And, and thank you again so much for giving us your time. And good luck with the release. And, hey, yeah. keep in touch. Thanks, We'd love guys. to have you back on when you put out more music. So. Anytime. And have fun with Sunglasses Kids. Say yeah, say hi, yeah? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Will do. Will do. Have a good one, Lau. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. All right, Andrew, wow, there you awesome. have it, man. That was another episode in our journey of this talking with Andrew and Chris thing, man. Very yeah. inspiring episode, I have to say. Yeah, that was really cool. I mean, I feel like we're we're uh, pretty, you know, spoiled with the amount of like hardworking guests we have. But like, she does so much. 
She she could take the cake, that's for sure. I don't want to speak too soon because I don't want to undermine the uh, immense talent in our back catalog of guests we've had. But I mean, right. all I know is that I want to go make something like right she now. Fits, she fits in well with the back catalog of guests that we've had. Exactly. And unfortunately, I have to go and make sure my homework gets done. So that's a bit of a buzzkill. But all that aside... Thank you guys again for hanging out with us for another great yes. episode of Talking with Andrew and Chris. Again, the links to her solo music, Lau, will be in the description, as well as all things Aztec Records. So please be sure to click down there. Check out her amazing roster of incredible artists. Of course, one of her artists that me and Andrew really love, Sunglasses Kid, will be on the show coming very later yes. on in this month, early Among March time. Others. So we plan to do a lot more in collaboration with Aztec, and we're very grateful and thankful for that. And we're also thankful for all the support you guys give us day in and day out. Andrew, in case someone stumbled upon us for the first time through the power that is the Synthwave community on this episode, why don't you tell them where it is they can find us, what it is we do here on YouTube and the interwebs? Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you because welcome, you know. I've heard from Chris that you guys are a delightful bunch, uh, filled with a lot of passionate opinions, so I'm really looking forward to hearing about them. Um, if you're here for the first time, if you're watching this, please hit that subscribe button down there because we're going to be putting out an episode every week, among uh, some other content coming down the line. We've got so many ideas, you know, just we have too many ideas, so please like subscribe if you're listening follow us you know so you stay up to date we're on spotify apple podcast all the other ones you know radio public stitcher breaker uh uh creaker Leaker, stapler stapler <laughs> um, packer uh, radio radio them. public that's a fun one that's a good one radio it's public. like public um, radio but not because you used to pay for it, the subscription, but we're on there, I guess, if you guys use right. that. We're there, though, so yeah. definitely look for us, and we're out there. And then while you're there, speaking of the 80s, if you like 80s aesthetic, talking TV kind of looks like it's from the 80s, and it's just a great show that Chris does with his buddy Dom, so check it out while you're checking us out, you know? Why not? Yeah, it's all a part of the Talkin' Podcast Network. You can find us on Instagram at Talkin' Podcast, Talkin' spelled T-A-L-K-I-N, no G. Again, that's Talkin' spelled T-A-L-K-I-N. We post videos every week on YouTube, audio episodes every week on all digital streaming services. Follow me and Andrew on our socials. We are musicians, and we are getting back to music this year. As soon as it is safe for us to do so, we will, and we can't wait for you guys to hear it. This is a show about life, music, and everything in between. And Amen. that's what we uh, we plan on bringing you a lot more of the in between as well as Andrew hinted at. We have a lot of new ideas coming in the next few weeks. So, Andrew, what's the sign off that we want to leave the people with here today? Because I think everyone could use this message. I'm riding a high off this episode at least. So, <laughs> um, I would say go listen to some kick-ass music from the '80s, and as always, stay sweet. Mm -hmm.